Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dor, and today I want to talk about the Big Five and how you can use it to understand yourself and what it can do and what it cannot. So the Big Five is meant to be the scientific version of personality psychology. How can science do personality psychology? Now, this does not mean it's necessarily the best instrument, but it does mean it gives itself strong statistical support and it gives and provides accurate and meaningful definitions and it helps understand and give basic verifiable information about our personality. So there are five scales in the big five, outgoingness, openness, neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Now neuroticism is the outlook here, it's a bit of uh, the fifth personality trait. And that means it's kind of different from the other four, in the sense that it maps out how prone we are to worrying, or to doubt, or to uncertainty, or confusion, or to stronger emotions, or stronger upheavals and changes in emotions, and mood, and temper. What you can say is, uh, the outgoing type is going to be a lot more comfortable putting themselves out there and putting themselves out there to other people, to be seen and heard, speaking out for themselves, taking attention, meeting new people, talking to others, engaging others. The open type is going to be a little bit more of an intellectual, the person that's always learning new subjects, that learns and entertains new theories, that has new ideas, that likes thinking about new subject matters. And the agreeable type is meant to be the person that is going to be collaborative and friendly. They will jump to help you out, they like to support other people, they are harmonious and friendly and they usually tend to trust others. Another type is the conscientious type, and the conscientious type is supposed to be planned and organized. They like to have things in clear boxes, and they like to have definitions for things, a structure to things. When do they do it? How do they do it? In what way? They like to follow their commitments and see to follow through on what they've said and to be consistent. On the other side of these are five other personality traits. Reservedness, for example, traditionality or lack of openness, uh, disagreeableness or sloppiness or lack of conscientiousness. So what you can see is a person can be outgoing or they can be a little bit more reserved or shy. A person can be open or they can be a little bit more traditional or closed-minded. A person can be agreeable or they can be a little bit more competitive or disagreeable. And a person can be conscientious or they can be a little bit more sloppy or disorganized. A person can be neurotic or they can be emotionally stable. What you see is five other sides of this picture. So Big Five describes people from different areas in society. Everyone is on a bell curve. Every personality trait is relative. Yeah, I'm outgoing, but not compared to that guy. Yeah, I'm a bit more reserved in this group with these kind of people because they are from a culture that is very outgoing. So the Big Five tries to explain these differences, focusing purely on our behavior. The Big Five does not describe what you're interested in, what your favorite subjects are, what kind of people you like to collaborate with, what the way of structure you have, or how you organize your environment. It only describes your need to have order for things. It only describes your need to learn new things, but not the subject matter itself. The MBTI is meant to be a system describing our interests and our values, what we tend to be interested in, what we tend to value the most, for example emotions or social situations or more logical systems or rational systems, for example more intuitive subjects, imagination, ideas, possibilities, or more physical subjects and activities, traditional activities, soccer, uh, going out with friends, partying, family events, dinners meeting up with people. The social types and the practical types tend to be sensing their nature and sensing in their interest. And uh, intuitive types tend to be innovators or creatives or idealists. The Big Five doesn't talk about these matters but focuses more on what we can see and what we can observe. We cannot necessarily prove what a person has, what kind of interests a person have or what kind of values a person has. These things are harder to measure. That's why the Big Five has gotten a lot more popular. The Big Five's focus on what we can measure and what we can see and what we can hear is more easy to back up in data and that makes it also more appealing to people who want a scientifically observable and measurable system. How do you really measure a person's interest for intellectual pursuits or ideas compared to their interest in sports or in traditional subject matters? How do you really measure these dimensions? What do they really mean? 
the Mary's Briggs has gotten a kind of vague or iffy brand along traditional psychologists. That's why these systems don't tend to go well together. There are some on the surface similarities when you talk, for example, about extroversion and introversion, as opposed to outgoingness and reservedness, but do not confuse the two. When Carl Jung coined the term extroversion, he said the extrovert was a person that was oriented by the external world, and the introvert a person oriented by the internal world. So the introvert couldn't and didn't necessarily have to be reserved, but could be outgoing. An introvert could be focused on, for example, what they are thinking, what they are feeling, what they're experiencing on the inside, and can be oblivious to other people's feelings and experiences. They might be constantly preoccupied with their own mind and their own mental framework, dreaming, thinking, envisioning, seeing things before themselves while the world around them passes on. The extrovert could be more oriented by what people were saying, what was happening, what they saw in the world around them, what could happen, what could do, we could do next, what could be most interesting, what could be most fun. But what you could see is uh, reservedness and shyness is almost a descriptor of how comfortable we are expressing ourselves, putting ourselves out there, how afraid we are of making mistakes or saying something stupid. Often what you see is the reserve type feels almost socially inhibited or afraid of moving forward. The reserve type wants to think before they make a decision, wants to prepare before they have a speech or a presentation, wants to look the, through the data, wants to sit down with the information, wants to study, wants to plan, wants to map, wants to chart, wants to work and perfect. So the reserved mind has a strong sense of cautiousness. It can present itself socially, but it doesn't have to. It can present itself rationally in uh, more rational fields, but it doesn't have to. What, it, what is the problem with the Big Five is the, this question of dimensionality of the personality traits. What you can say is a person can be outgoing in one situation and reserved in another. We can be very outgoing around friends and family members, but we might be a little bit more reserved in new circles with new people who we don't trust or don't know. And this can map out different experiences we've had. Perhaps we are used to, in new situations, uh, having felt judged or having felt criticized, and so we become a little bit more inhibited. But perhaps because we have grown more comfortable around our friends, we can be more outgoing in these circles. So what you do and what you have to do is you have to connect the personality traits to get the feel of this. What you can do is you can start connecting outgoingness with, for example, neuroticism. And this is what the Big Five has started to do, and this is really fascinating. The Big Five has started to develop four personality types. The average personality type, the reserved personality type, the role model, and the self-centered personality type. So the average personality type has high neuroticism and extroversion, but low openness. What does this mean? Well, it typically it means that this person is going to be extroverted, but a little bit more neurotic. You know, you have the reserved neurotic, or the shy neurotic, and the shy neurotic can be socially anxious, afraid of saying something stupid, careful, uh, prone to worrying about what other people think. But the extroverted neurotic can be a little bit more temperamental, a little bit more moody, prone to conflict with other people, afraid of what other people say, but still, in a sense, more emotionally term turbulent. This means this extroverted neurotic type can uh, speak without thinking, can sometimes say something stupid, can sometimes offend people, but can other times be a little bit more calm and a little bit more relaxed. What this with the neurotic type is it goes up and down, its emotions shift a lot more, where the emotionally stable person tends to have a little bit more steady emotional swings. The reserve type is emotionally stable, but not open and not neurotic. So what you see with the reserve type is the reserve type doesn't necessarily have to be anxious. And this is very important. Not all people who are reserved are going to be anxious. They're not reserved because they're anxious. They can be reserved because they don't just like engaging people. They're happy being around to by themselves. They like sitting alone. They like uh, having their own free time at work. They like... Uh, taking things easy, taking things step by step, just going about their day, not going rushing through anything, not having to be in a hurry all the time. So what you see in the reserve type that is low in neuroticism is just a uh, calm, steady, but inhibited and cautious personality. The role model is very interesting because it's very different from this. 
They share the low neuroticism just like the reserve type, but they are very high in almost all other traits. They are often out, uh, outgoing, they are often open-minded, they are often very agreeable, they like working with other people, they like uh, learning about new ideas, and they tend to like putting themselves out there. They tend to present themselves as examples, positive examples in society or ideals. People tend to look at these people as a map of how we should all be. Everyone should be like this kind of guy. Everybody should be open-minded. So He's so open-minded, such a great guy. He's so talkative and friendly and social. He's easy to work with, he's collaborative, you know. People like these kind of people and they like these people also because they are very emotionally stable. You're not likely to get a mood swing from this person, they're not likely to get upset with you, they're likely to keep calm, they're likely to uh, be count accountable, they're conscientious, they like to be keep things organized. So what you see is just uh, that the big five tends to paint an ideal, how we should act compared to how we act. Often the big five tends to paint this ideal where four of these traits are better than the other four, or five of these traits are better than the other four. It's better to be emotionally stable. It's better to be outgoing. It's better to be open. It's better to be agreeable. It's better to be conscientious. But it's not necessarily always going to be open about this, and there are theories in the big five that suggest that there is a value to being reserved, to being close-minded, traditional, to being disagreeable. For example, there are theories that agreeable people can become doormats or prone to, uh, well, letting people walk all over them. The self-centered type is the fourth type in the Big Five. The self-centered person is high in extroversion, but below average in openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. So not necessarily neurotic, but very outgoing. They like to talk, they like to engage people, they have a very strong sense of self, but they don't tend to be that interested in other people's ideas, they tend to have strong personal viewpoints, but they don't tend to like thinking about what other people think from the other person's perspective. The self-centered type, basically, what you can see about the openness type or the low openness type is that the low openness type can have very strong viewpoints. The low openness type tends to be very sure of how the world is and how the world should be. So what you see is the openness type tends to open with more flexible minds or more uncertain minds. They are more prone to change. They might change opinions and beliefs frequently through their life. They might move from being socialist to being liberals to being back to socialism or towards more environmentally friendly or progressive policy. They might go from having one philosophical viewpoint to changing to another. They might be open to rethinking and reconsidering their facts or opinions on scientific or social matters like uh, how to uh, dress or act or how to behave. So what you see is they can entertain the viewpoints of other people in an open and critical manner. So the low openness type then has very strong viewpoints and this has its benefits. Having strong viewpoints also means being able to assert yourself around other people to say this is how things are. To create an environment that is more consistent and more structured where people tend to keep and maintain a similar way of functioning. You know what you get, what you see is what you get, what you do will, will keep <laughs> happening. You, the low openness type tends to create roots and tends to make things last, it tends to maintain and keep things in tight order, it tends to make sure that what we have is going to stick, especially when it's paired with high conscientiousness. Agreeableness, the factor of uh, how co cooperative we are, should be contrasted with competitiveness or disagreeableness. I like the word competitiveness because what you see it in the disagreeable type is this ability to think critically about various matters. Things can be wrong or right. Things can be scientific or they can be irrational. Things can be stupid or they can be smart. The disagreeable type tends to be characterized by scoring higher on the dark triads of personality, being a slightly more egocentric, slightly more focused on themselves, slightly less uh, um, caring or nurturing for other people, more likely to upset other people or say something bad because they believe it's right. So what you see in disagreeable type is they tend to be a lot more critical uh, openly, initially, they tend to be critical to new ideas and to what other people are saying. They tend to be have a stronger personal viewpoints. This is what I believe. This is what I think is right. 
So the disagreeable type is not disagreeable because they're disagreeable, but because they have strong personal viewpoints and a strong sense of self that they tend to protect. And you see this also in the self-centered type. They tend to score lower in agreeableness, but high in extroversion. So the self-centered type has strong personal viewpoints, has uh, a sense of competitiveness, and that means they tend to be more focused on asserting themselves and proving themselves to other people. They might want to be the best, they might want to come out ahead. So when you're talking with a disagreeable person, their thoughts might be, how do I get ahead? What do I do to win? How do I win the argument? How do I beat you? How do I get ahead? Where you talk to the agreeable person, their matter might be, how do we get along? How do we combine these things? How do we connect these two ideas? How do we work together? How do we make things better together? So, studying these matters, you might learn a lot about people, and I see a lot of people are very critical of the Big Five, when they shouldn't be. The Big Five is a great alternative to the MTI, because it studies different things than MTI. You can study both systems, and you can gain benefits from both. The Big Five is more scientific, and that has its benefits. The MTI is more hard to prove or study scientifically, but it might still have its benefits. So what I advise everyone, no matter where its perspective they come from, is keep an open mind. Well, <laughs> keep high openness <laughs> and uh, consider that different systems might provide different benefits. And start connecting the dots. Start seeing how you are from different perspectives. Start learning about yourself and other people. Because a person who knows themselves well, a person who knows other people well, is going to be better at collaborating with and working together with other people. Thanks for watching this video and um, if you like it leave a like, share and subscribe to other people who might be interested and I hope to see you guys.